We are back, and tonight I am going to be joined by clinical psychologist Dr. Bruce Levine. I want to talk to him a little bit about how all these kids in schools are being suspended and expelled for things like bringing a paper gun to school. Uh, now he's authored actually several books, including Surviving America's Depression Epidemic and Common Sense Rebellion, Taking Back Your Life from Drugs, Shrinks, Corporations, and a World Gone Crazy. He joins us now. Thank you for coming on today, Dr. Levine. Sure, great to be here. Well, okay, since the Sandy Hook shooting, we've seen, for lack of a better word, people are basically freaking out over guns in this country, and our government is now openly trying to uh, restrict our Second Amendment. And in the last couple months in schools, we've actually seen a lot of incidences of children being suspended and expelled for bringing toy guns to school. We've seen kindergartners uh, get expelled for playing cops and robbers on the playground and using their finger as a gun and saying, pow. Uh, we even saw a little girl with a piece of paper. It was shaped like an L. And uh, they said, that's a paper gun. You can't have that. And they searched her in front of the class. They were calling her a murderer. Um, even a, a little five-year-old with a Hello Kitty bubble gun, they said it's a terrorist threat. Um, and these kids are having nightmares. They're crying. What does it do to these little kids when they do this to them in their school? Well, certainly when adults overreact and show poor judgment, and um, tr suspend, expel kids for, young kids uh, for doing that kind of thing. I mean, one of a couple of things are gonna happen depending on their temperament, depending on these kids' personality, some of them will get very depressed and feel shamed and feel something's horrible about themselves will be traumatizing. For some of these other kids, they'll just, uh, it'll be an early ex experience of having no respect for authorities. They'll immediately think these authorities are idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, so those are some of the different kinds of reactions that kids will have when adults use really poor judgment and overreact. Well, I mean, does a five-year-old even really have a concept that their little toy is a, a gun uh, or their finger saying pow is a threat to anybody? I mean, do they even really understand that? I think they're thinking they're just being, I mean, they're just being kids. They're not thinking that they're doing anything violent. And for most of uh, society, a five-year-old pointing their finger and going bang and playing cops and robbers um, prior to all these school shootings, prior to Sandy Hook, would have, would have not been noticed, would have not, and nothing would have been stated about it unless it was going on in a classroom and it was disrupting some kind of teaching, which is, is not the case with these kids. Well, doesn't it, I mean, it doesn't just affect the kid that's being punished either. It also affects all the rest of the kids in class. It's sort of like a group brainwashing almost in uh, saying that guns are bad. We need to not even look at a gun, don't play with a gun, don't even think about a gun. Right, but I think part of it is is that on these extreme examples, um, in some ways we're missing the larger, scarier point. Um, you know, these examples that you're talking about, they certainly have gone on where uh, teachers and administrators have used colossally horrible overreacting judgment here, a lack of judgment. Um, but that's less scary for me because those really, those are a handful, you know, not that many events have happened on that kind. I mean, every one that, that have happened, we're going to see on the news. But the ones that are happening, millions of events are happening all the time where kids are, are normally going through being depressed or maybe uh, obsessing too much on something or having anxiety. And, and these kids are being labeled and pathologized and put on uh, medications that we now know are, are often making these kids more likely to uh, commit violent acts. We know these from the statistics. Well, actually, I, that brings up my next point, because a frequent contributor to InfoWars, John Rappaport, wrote an article about all these incidents, and he said that it's really more like an operant conditioning kind of thing for a thought crime, where they'll say, these are adverse thoughts you're having when you have these little guns or you play cops and robbers, and use that as an excuse to then later uh, put these kids on psychiatric medications. Well, I don't think a lot of these kids who, you know, who are just pointing their fingers. I mean, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, they uh, are, are doing a lot of horrible things, but I mean, even a lot of those reports that you talk about, they're, some of the psychologists themselves were laughing that these were overreactions. And a kid, lots of kids who are po just pointing a finger, a five-year-old, are not going to be immediately put on a Prozac or antidepressants. That's not the scary thing. Is The scary things are, there are that there are millions of kids who actually are depressed. They actually have good reasons to be angry. They maybe are worrying a lot about things. And these are the kids who are um, being just easily, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, being put on medication, and we now 
don't know that there's a, a lot of uh, strong negative reactions to these medications, that they, they produce uh, manic responses, that a lot of these uh, school shooters, uh, we know documented over 66 of these school shooters have uh, been on medications, been on antidepressants, been on these um, uh, psychostimulants like Ritalin. And these are the really scary kinds of things. Definitely. Well, actually, that brings up a good point, too, because in the president's executive orders that he issued after Sandy Hook, one of the things he said is that they want to get more young people on treatment. It just said treatment. Isn't that like saying they're, they're basically going to put more young people on these drugs, which we know have side effects. They cause hostility. They cause increased uh, suicidal tendencies, aggression, mood swings, all kinds of things. That's the scary thing. Now, a lot of these kids really do need help, but mental health treatment, at least standard mental health treatment in America, is exactly what you said. It's like if a kid is labeled as depressed, and we know from the CDC in 2011, uh, among teenagers, 12 to 17, 3.7% are on antidepressants, which translates out to over a million kids in America are on antidepressants just in that age group. And we also know, and this is off of a manufacturer's report, the people who make Lovox, which by the way was the drug that Eric Harris, who was a shooter in uh, Columbine, Columbine, was on. That um, that four percent. This is lo this is Solvay. This is their their report. Um, it's very conservative. Four percent have manic reactions. So four percent using manufacturers' report of a million kids on antidepressant. That's over forty thousand kids who are going to have manic reactions. What's that? Poor judgment, impulsivity, wow. um, agitation, um, uh, sometimes even delusions, um, hallucinations, and and that's off of the. You know, lots of other folks who've looked at these things say that that manic reactions are much higher when these kids go off of these drugs, which they do because they're kids, they'll withdraw off of them, you'll have these uh, extreme kind of with the anti antidepressant discontinuation syndrome, which is just a withdrawal response that can make a kid have akathisia, which makes you feel like you're, you're coming out of your skin. And so we know just off of that one class of drugs, antidepressants, we, we've turned loose thousands of kids who are going to potentially do some things very destructive. And of course, kids, lots of, we've got three and a half million kids in America on these Ritalin, Adderall, uh, Speed, uh, ADHD kind of drugs. And we know that perhaps as many as 10% of these kids move into these kind of manic reactions and get diagnosed as bipolar. So there's another couple of hundred thousand kids that we've just turned loose out there um, because the reaction in America today is when kids are having any kind of difficulty, when they're somewhat depressed, often for good reasons, or they're, they're anxious, often for good reasons, we put them on medication and, 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 they're, they're, and we're not looking at these horrific adverse effects that when you look at them in, in the aggregate, of these huge amount of numbers, even if they're small percentages, like 4% become manic. Well, 4% of a million kids on antidepressants is a lot of kids who could become manic and dangerous. I've actually read several things in the last few days that have really disturbed me about SSR, is one of them being that the fastest growing age group that's taking these medications is actually preschoolers. Well, um, I haven't seen those statistics, um, you know, that, that, but we know that in America, uh, you know, when I was starting out in practice 25 years ago, you would never see a little kid on these psychiatric drugs. I mean, the idea of pediatric bipolar disorder was unheard of. It was, you know, the idea of labeling a three and four year old with a bipolar disorder just seemed ridiculous. I mean, the, the symptoms of bipolar having to do with poor judgment and grandiosity and lability, these are all these symptoms were what people said was what a normal for a three year old. And um, this whole idea of kids being labeled younger and younger with these kinds of conditions that are just kind of normal. Kids who are you know, three and four years old who are just not paying attention because they're three-year-olds or four-year-olds being labeled with ADHD and be given given these speed amphetamine type of, of drugs. This is all very new stuff in the last 10, 15 years, and it's terrifying. And of course, it's all driven by drug company profit. Well, that, that's my next question, actually, because, I mean, there's been a huge uptick. We've seen an increase of like 400 percent, I read, in antidepressant use since 1988. Last year, it was declared that it was one of the number one prescriptions in the age group from 18 to 44. I mean, we are using a massive amount of antidepressants in this country. I think it's one in 10 people now take it. Most people that take it take it for more than two years, the majority. And what, what is this causing this huge uptick in all this antidepressant use? Well, just in this one class of drugs, you know, we're focused on antidepressants um, the, in terms of the whole issue of potential uh, uh, violence, school shootings 
shooters. We know, for example, as I mentioned before, and viewers could uh, look this up on, uh, there's a lot of websites on this, SSRI Stories is one good website, but we know there's Definitely. 66 documented uh, school shooters, um, and that's not included. There's a lot of these ones people su suspect Okay, like this recent Adam Lanza, but this is that's not even included among the 66 because we don't have a coroner's report on that yet. But these are these are confirmed. The 66 school shooters have been on these different kinds of medications. So I mentioned Eric Harris on the antidepressant Lovix, the Columbine, one of the two Columbine shooters. Um, lots of these folks who are famous here. Uh, Kip Kankel in our uh, Springfield, Oregon, was on Prozac and on Ritalin. Um, the kid in Red Lake, Minnesota, who shot about around 10 folks. He was on uh, 60 milligrams of Prozac and so it goes on and on and um, we know that this is no accident because again as I mentioned before a significant number of folks who are taking these drugs are going to have manic reactions they're going to be what we call disinhibited so when you take a psychotropic drug of any kind whether it's Prozac or cocaine all these psychotropic drug means that a drug that affects one's neurotransmitter serotonin dopamine a norepinephrine and for many people who take these you get the sense of being disinhibited which means that you just do things that you would never ordinarily do, okay, which often happens when people use alcohol. Um, it's just one of those things that happen. For any, when you're not on these kind of psychotropic drugs, things pass through your mind that you never act on. You're not impulsive. You don't do anything about it. But when you're on these kinds of drugs, you're much more likely to act on thoughts you would never act on. And that, and if, for kids who are walking around with a lot of rage, that spells trouble. And it has spelled some serious destructive trouble for, the, for, for society, for their schools and for themselves. Yeah, and we see these commercials on TV all the time. When the commercials first started for these drugs, it was more specific about what your symptoms were, and it was like, ask your doctor today. And now it just seems like these commercials say, do you have emotions? Tell your doctor to give you drugs. I mean, it's amazing. Right. I mean, and they know these drug, these the, the people who work for the who make these commercials are very, very clever, very, very smart. They're smart enough to realize that they could put on these drug commercials, which, by the way, were illegal in America up until 1997, when the drug company Power um, convinced um, the uh, government to allow these commercials on TV. So we're one of the two countries in the industrial world that allow these commercials on, and they're very clever. They realize that they could they could spend 75 percent of that commercial listing side effects, horrific side effects. If you actually listen to the commercials and don't mute them, which a lot of us do, including myself nowadays, I get so sick of hearing them. But but it, but it doesn't yeah, matter everywhere. because because the visuals the visuals of seeing a person who's upset and hurting and all of a sudden taking a pill and then the happy music and the happy smile, those are powerful manipulative forces that get people to ask their doctor. And we also know from lots of studies is once you go in and you ask your doctor for some Prozac or Paxil or any kind of antidepressants, you're going to get them. You may not have an easy, such an easy time scoring benzodiazepines like Valium and Xanax. Doctors are a little bit more reluctant because they've been taught those things are highly addictive, but you can score Prozac, Paxil, like from any doctor, very easily. Almost like a candy machine. Sure, when like when did you become aware that that these things weren't actually helping anybody? When did I become aware of that? That they were hurting more than helping. Well, we've known for a long time. I mean, anything you do in life is a uh, you know is a cost benefit analysis. And the scary thing about uh, antidepressants is is that we've known for a long time, and now this is finally being revealed in the mainstream press. It's actually 60 Minutes did a big story on this. Is that that we know Prozac compared to placebo really doesn't work very well. In fact, in the majority of trials, when you compare Prozac or, or any of these antidepressants to a sugar pill placebo, the, the antidepressants fail to outperform the placebo. So in general, um, the effects, the positive effects of these antidepressants are really, we would be better off if doctors could still give placebo sugar pills. And so there's, there's not really great positive effects as there are with things like antibiotics are very important for certain people with certain infections. So there's very little scientifically in terms of positive effects, and there's horrible adverse effects. So in terms of a drug having been approved, it, it, these drugs should never have been approved when you consider how horrible the adverse effects are and how problem and how little any kind of beneficial effects. Now, that, that's not to say there's not going to be 25, 30 percent of people out there who take these Prozac, Paxil, Zola, who say, oh, it saved their life. It was great. But that's true for sugar pills as well, okay? So you have what we call the placebo effect is mostly what makes these drugs really, really work for people. 
Well, I, I, I want to get your opinion on this. I actually wrote an article that's up on InfoWars today about this. A study was released yesterday that actually claims that people who have major depressive disorder, if they take antidepressants, it will help make their vaccines more effective. That's the new, and it, and it was co-written. There were 20 authors on this study. Four of them are actually employed by Merck, and the vaccine that they were talking about was one of Merck's vaccines for shingles. Oh. There you go. So, I mean, that's the thing I think that your audience is much more aware of than the general public, but that all of these studies that are performed on any of these antidepressants, they're all being funded by, by the, and on all these drugs in general, all being funded by the drug companies. A lot of Americans still have the fantasy that the Food and Drug Administration actually, you know, actually studies these drugs independently, um, and it, it's not the case. All of these drugs, the data um, that is given to the FDA for approval is the, uh, off of studies that are paid for by the drug companies themselves. And we know drug companies have gotten into some serious trouble over the years, some serious fines, because they've held back um, held back a negative effects on, on, on these drugs. And also, too, the way they perform the studies. Um, again, because they've already sunk millions of dollars in the pre-approval process, once they get to do these studies, there's so much incentive to have them look good that they, that they doctor up these studies. The research design makes these drugs always look much better than they really are. And so uh, over the years, a lot of us have come to see this, this phenomenon that, that these drugs have been declared, especially psychiatric drugs, Drugs like antidepressants have been declared safe and effective. And then, lo and behold, as these drugs are moving towards the end of their patent, which has happened with Prozac, it's no longer patented, you know, is, is that all of a sudden you see these studies showing like, well, it's not really that safe and it's pretty dangerous. Why is that? Because drug companies don't care anymore. They don't care when, they, when generics can be handed out on them. They want everybody to get all excited about the new group of drugs that they've patented that they can make a ton of money on. So that's been the cycle since I've been uh, a psychologist for over you know over 30 years that we we hear all this nonsense about these drugs being safe and effective and on and on until they're until they're about ready to go off patent and then we hear all the truth well i actually read that america though though we're obviously not the largest country in the world we take the most psychiatric medications of any other country in the world why do you think that is well, a couple of reasons. One, one is is that the drug companies have so much more power here than any anywhere else. They are able to get these commercials on television here, where a lot of the rest of the world realize it's insane to expose um, the general pu public, especially kids, to propaganda about go ask your doctor if you got the breast. So drug companies have that going for them. They also in in America are able to throw money at the American Psychiatric Association, throw money at the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, throw money at psychiatric departments and universities, and almost every way that the general public and doctors hear about drugs, get information about these uh, drugs, is, is really, if you follow the money trail, not that far you have to follow it. It all comes from drug companies. So it's very rare that anybody is getting any kind of information, seeing any kind of studies that isn't drug company back. And so, and, that, and think about it, if you were running a drug company where uh, you had products like even these an these antipsychotics. I give an example. I've written a lot about Zyprexa, which is made by Eli Lilly, which that was their big money maker after Prozac. Um, and so, Zyprexa has achieved four billion dollars a year, five billion dollars a year. This is a huge amount of money. And when you're and, and when you when you know that your your product could potentially make that kind of money to throw a million here to a university department, a couple of million here to an institution, or throw a couple of million here to somebody who's leaving national institute to mental health who's been friendly to you this is chump change you know so they're spending a little bit of a little bit of money they even tolerate huge fines against them which is also the case they they were busted for off label marketing this Zyprexa, which means they illegally marketed this antipsychotic to to people um, to doctors to use for kids who weren't psychotic to use for old people who are disruptive and in old age homes you're not allowed to do that it's illegal it's off label marketing but so they get fined a billion dollars well that's about what they make in a quarter, one quarter for Zyprexa. So, so it's all about these drug companies are smart enough to spend a few bucks here to make tons of money elsewhere. And you can pull that off in the United States of America. Uh, well, excuse the pun, but it's crazy. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Levine. Sure. Glad to be here. And people can find you at brucelevine.net. Do you have any projects coming up? 
No, uh, last, a lot of, I've written about this book, a lot about this in Surviving America's Depression Epidemic, which is my prior book before Get Up Stand Up. And in Surviving America's Depression Epidemic, I talk about this, a lot of what we're talking about here today, but also different ways of dealing with depression uh, besides, uh, besides uh, pharmaceuticals. Well, people definitely need to look into this. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Thank you, Melissa. And that about wraps it up for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to us at prisonplanet.tv.